Greetings, I'm Dr. Pang Hong Wu from Singapore. It's my honor to be invited to give a talk to the ISMIS meeting and the MISS Summit Forum. I'll be sharing my screen now. My topic today is multiple level lumbar endoscopic unilateral laminotomy with bilateral decompression in morbid obesity. The technical challenges, tips and tricks. I come from the west part of the island. Singapore is in the south part of Southeast Asia, just south of Malaysia. We cover a population of about 700,000 residents, about 12% of the Singapore population. In our hospital, we have faced a number of patients with obesity. And in the ASEAN country as well as in East Asia, obesity is getting more common due to the increase in affluence and decrease in physical activities. In 2016, 39% of adults aged 18 years and over was found to be overweight. And that's about 13% of the world's adult population. The worldwide prevalence of obesity has nearly tripled in the years from 1975 to 2016. Hence, obesity it is a common problem and it is getting increasingly important for our population. There are multiple spine issues related to obesity. Obesity has allowed the patients to carry a higher load on the spine, due to, which leads to accelerated wear of the disc and facet joints, leading to higher prevalence of the back pain and degenerative spine condition, such as spinal stenosis, spondylolisthesis, degenerative disc disease, and facet atrophy. And back pain has a higher prevalence in the patients with obesity. While the patient is in the hospital, there are multiple concerns in transportation and safety. We need wider beds, we need heavier lifting and transferring equipment, we need wider commodes, wheelchairs, uh, wider blood pressure cuff, just to name a few, a few of the differences. In the operating room, we probably need a larger table, and we need to check the weight capacity of our table so it is uh, safe in most of the patients uh, in uh, doing surgery on them. For radiology, we need to check whether the MRI and the CT scan uh, are wide enough for the obese patient. And uh, I think it is, if we time allows, it's advisable to bring the awake patient um, probably an hour or two before surgery at least to the operating room and check whether if the patient is really heavy, to check whether the patient can fit under the operating bed. That's the ideal situation. The challenges in high BMI patients in the pre-op planning includes looking at their comorbidities. They tend to have high blood pressure, diabetes, sleep apnea, dyslipidemia, atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease, and uh, a chronic state of systemic inflammation and poor thrombotic states. Such uh, patients are actually candidates for endoscopic, endoscopic spine surgery uh, for a few reasons. One is that uh, the patient have, tend to have a higher uh, risk of infection, so a smaller wound can help in preventing infection. Uh, as patients will uh, mobilize early after endoscopic spine surgery due to less pain in the wound site, and so it is better to prevent DVT in this group of patients. One incision in a high BMI patient may be able to do multiple levels, um, in my case, I do up to two levels, but I have checked using the tube, we can go up to four levels in using one incision for high BMI patients. I will explain why. But the real thing is the anesthesia, anesthesia challenges, and every aspect is challenging. We have difficulties in managing the airway. Uh, epidural anesthesia with sedation is challenging because uh, anesthesia, if they over sedate the patient, there will be difficulty in getting into the airway in obese patient in prone position. In fact, my anesthesia suggests that we should do GA in such a heavy patient because uh, she will have difficulty in getting in her airway control if her sedation is not enough. IV anesthesia is preferred to gas anesthesia due to high fat ratio, which makes gas anesthesia more unpredictable and the patient may take longer to recover from anesthesia. It's more of the anesthetic agent is channeled to the fat. Propofol is one of the most popular drugs to be used to induce and maintain the TVA, uh, these issues have to be discussed with the anesthetist before the surgery starts. A uh, pre-op briefing and uh, discussion be useful. So besides the anesthetic concern, we, there are numerous uh, papers suggesting from pre-op assessment to organization to intraoperative management and post-operative management in terms of the airway, 
and the circulation management of this obese patient has to be paid attention. As surgeons, we need to warn our anesthetists beforehand that we are going to get a difficult case in an obese patient for our surgery. In terms of positioning, we need to get uh, more operative room personnel into the theater. We need them to be strong and uh, preferably uh, we need more people to, so that we can carry the patient effectively on the bed. The bed, as I have mentioned, we need to check whether the, what's the maximum capacity. Sufficient padding has to be added in the uh, obese patient. Bear in mind, obese patients have cre uh, crevices which need to be uh, adequately padded and uh, preventive of uh, unnecessary skin abrasion and so sometimes extra padding is useful. There are a lot of radiographic limitations and that's pre-op, intra-op radiographic limitations. Obesity with lots of soft tissue impair the quality and exposure of the plain radiograph. X-ray beams is of a greater distance to penetrate the subject and then the longer exposure time is needed and introdu introduction of motion artifacts are common because they are longer distance and longer exposure time is necessary. Obtaining diagnostic quality x-ray can be challenging and needs a technical adjustment. It is preferable to have an experienced radiographer in the operating room when we are doing such cases. What we did in our case is we tried to collimate as closer to the lumbar spine as possible. Collimation helps to eliminate the penetration issue in the beds and the bowel shadows. Standing x-ray done pre-op can show that, uh, can give us warning sign of a difficulty in uh, fluoroscopy. As you can see in this case, uh, standing x-ray film did not manage to show uh, good uh, quality x-ray for the lumbar spine. Too many soft tissue shadow and the bone definition isn't clear. So we'll be expecting difficulty in the intraoperative fluoroscopy as well. And doing MRI, fortunately, she managed to fit in the MRI machine. However, you can see that she has a distance of about uh, 8 to 10 cm away from the skin incision to the lamina. This is challenging in the sense that uh, endoscopic equipment may not be long enough for the decompression scope. So it's important to understand our scope dimensions, our drill, uh, di our drill dimension and the length, as well as that of our pun carousel punches and forceps length. If necessary, we may get uh, uh, transforminal endoscopic equipment to stand by in the room as they have a longer length uh, to reach the patient's lamina. So thorough understanding of the various equipment issue will be useful. A threaded cannula will be useful in the high BMI patient as they maintain the scope in the correct position. Already we have uh, patients with difficulty in fluoroscopy so we will try our best to keep the working retractor in the position as long as possible and a threaded cannula can help in that. One good, uh, one good point about obese patients is that one soft tissue uh, have a thick soft, being, having a bigger soft tissue window or thicker soft tissue allow us to assess to multiple level from the same incision because of the mobility of the soft tissue above the lamina. So it is a double-edged ward. It can lead to wrong level surgery easily. So uh, in the surgery, we need to uh, if we are not sure of the level, we have to check. For me, I make uh, one incision, I reach the two levels, started with uh, the L3-4, and which is the more severe stenosis site, and then I went on to the L4-5. In L3-4, we did the fluoroscopy and double check on the level. I make an endoscopic drilling to make an impression after I do the fluoroscopy, and I continue to reference from there as I move along the surgery. And as you can see, the same incision can actually reach uh, two levels easily by stretching the soft tissue up and down. And you can see that uh, the fluoroscopy isn't clear in the AP view, as you can see from here. And on the lateral view, you, as we anticipated, the, um, and the re working retractor and the scope is actually a distance away from the lamina. So uh, we, at the later part of the surgery, as we reach a contralateral side, essentially only the drill endoscopic drill and the kerosene punches and forceps are able to reach the contralateral side. The, um, the endoscope no longer can pass point to the contralateral side, despite surgery planning. Sometimes a uh, longer radio frequency ablator can be an option. Consider using the transforminal sense radio frequency ablator because the distance is further away from the central region. 
So as we can see, we started from L3.4 and then went on to L4.5. Despite the collimation, the images are not clear. So the, the compression technique that I use uh, described in this uh, paper written by Professor Hilson Kim and myself. This decompression technique is what we call outside-in technique. We started uh, by talking on the V point, which is the laminal facet junction on the medial aspect of the facet joint. And then we do a uh, epsilateral laminotomy and then the contralateral laminotomy. And finally, removing the flavum as one block. This is a video that of the surgery of this high BMI patient. She's 68 year old, her BMI is 42. She has claudication distance of less than five minutes, uh, less than 10 minutes. This is her, this uh, MRI we have discussed before. Here's the nose. She walked gingerly, but she's uh, ambulant. Uh, she weighed a BMI of 42. That's difficult. Some difficulty in uh, transferring all the table. We started the first level as L3-4. Uh, we find the B point with uh, under fluoroscopic guidance. We started uh, epsilateral laminotomy um, with the cathode cordal and then subsequently cathode laminotomy. And as drew is only actual it's used for soft tissue and SK is long enough. We are really stretching the limits of the equipment as most of the equipment are unable to reach. Uh, as the endoscope is unable to reach long enough, I use a sleeve to protect the tissue on the contralateral side. Now I'm doing a epsilateral SAP resection and uh, some laminotomy on the catholic lamina. You can see that uh, we can uh, able to do the Deep, deep uh, superficial, deep flavum uh, resection using the kerosene punch. The sleeve is really useful. I use a 3mm drill bit. Uh, as we can't really get the scope deep in, we use the 3mm drill bit and perform the S contralateral SAP resection with the um, drill protected by the sleeve, as you can see from here. Once we can see the contralateral size uh, traversing nerve root, we went to the L45. We start a similar procedure starting with the medial V-point of L45 and uh, doing the laminotomy, starting with caudal laminotomy, then cataract laminotomy, that's like resection of the IAP is sufficient enough to expose the underlying SAP. We do the resection of the spinal laminar junction, and again, I use a sleeve, as we can't reach really long enough to use the working retractor to protect soft tissue. The sleeve is helpful in protecting the neural element in the contralateral side. Now we resect the, uh, the contralateral flavum, and the epsilateral flavum by loosening it. I tried to remove them as one block. I was successful in this uh, particular flavum, removing it as one block. Um, the contralateral flavum, however, is really difficult to be um, removed as a block because of the, as I said, uh, the scope is of a further distance from the target site. Nevertheless, we perform a sufficient decompression uh, of both sides. And again, on the contralateral side, uh, we have to use a sleeve with the 3mm uh, drill. This sleeve will allow us to protect the dura. As you can see, we drew with uh, open dura, which is pretty dangerous, but the sleeve allows us to safely execute that. We don't have to use that all the time, but uh, in circumstances where working retractor is not uh, able to be used, in obese patient, we can use that to help. So uh, one small incision for two levels of compression. Patient has no pain, he has one uh, VI uh, six on uh, discharge, a small wound, and the patient is discharged in the next morning. I've seen the patient currently, she has VAS of zero, three months post-op, and a VAS and an ODI of zero, three months post-op. After this COVID-19, I would like to uh, invite uh, some of you, if not all of you, to Singapore, to my hospital, and uh, to share ideas and discuss strategies in improving endoscopic care. I thank you very much for your patience in uh, this session of my talk. If there's any question, please let me know. Thank you.